Good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Nick Gotso. I am the manager of programs and education here at Music Counts, and I am delighted to be uh, the host for tonight's town hall. Um, and it's so great to see so many people um, joining from across the country, some familiar faces and some new ones. So feel free to introduce yourselves in the comments, tell us where you're joining from, what you teach, and uh, why you're here. Um, so we started the uh, town hall series, uh, the Music Counts Learn Town Hall series, in response to the pandemic. Um, we thought it would be a great opportunity to bring together teachers from all across the country to have important conversations that are uh, of relevance to music educators at this moment. So we've had conversations about um, decolonizing music education, how to respond to teaching remotely, uh, the intersection between music education and mental wellness that has become so apparent uh, during the pandemic. And tonight, as we're heading back to school, uh, we thought it would be a really great opportunity to bring some teachers together to have a conversation about the fact that music education is not just one thing. There Music education can sound like and can look like so many things. So we have an amazing group of teachers here tonight um, to share their story in terms of how they've grown as music teachers, how they've grown the programs at their school to meet um, those evolving student needs. Um, and again, I can't thank teachers who are joining tonight enough. I know this is not the most relaxed time to be a teacher. So the fact that you're taking time out of your evening to join us, we really appreciate it. Um, this is meant to be an open dialogue. so. Feel free to uh, send your comments in in the, uh, uh, in the comments and your questions and all that. We'll be getting to those throughout the event and at the end as well. Um, before we go any further, I would just like to thank Lyric Friend, who is the presenting sponsor uh, for tonight's town hall. Uh, since 2019, Lyric Friend has invested close to or over $17,000 uh, into the Music Counts Band Aid program. So those dollars go directly into schools all across the country who don't have what they need to make music education possible for kids at their school. So because of partners like Lyric Find, we're able to bring music to kids who otherwise wouldn't have access. So thank you so much to Lyric Find for your ongoing support of music education. Um, now, before we keep move on, moving on, I will hand it over to Nicole for our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territories in which we are gathered from across Turtle Island. All treaties and nations in all provinces and territories, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Laguanguan and Coast Salish peoples of the West Coast to the Metis and Inuit and to the Mi'kmaq peoples of the East Coast. We acknowledge that Indigenous peoples are the traditional guardians of this land that we call Canada, where we live, work, play, sing, and dance. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, like I mentioned, um, open dialogue. If you're just joining, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, introduce yourself in the comments. And as we're having the conversation tonight, uh, feel free to chime in in the comments. Let us know what you're thinking. If you have a question, feel free to put it in there. We're going to be bringing in those questions from you throughout the event tonight. Um, so before we get into um, the actual subject matter of the conversation, I'll just have each of our panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll get things going. Uh, Zeta, do you want to start us off? Uh, hi, I'm Zeta Ali. I am a middle school music teacher from Brampton, Ontario, and a lifelong music lover. And I've been teaching for about 20 years. Amazing. Thank you so much. Steve? Hi, I'm Steve Giddings. I teach at Montague Consolidated School and surrounding area, I suppose. And um, I also have a website called stevesmusicroom.com. You may have come across it at some point. If you haven't, maybe check it out later, but we're not talking about that right now. So um, I'll be, uh, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, yeah, let's go to her. I'm over in PEI, by the way, just so you know. Thanks, Steve. And I'm in New Brunswick, just so everyone knows. Uh, Nicole. Uh, Tanche, hello. Uh, my name is Nicole Schitz. I am AT from Prince Alfred, Saskatchewan, living in Edmonton. I'm an elementary music specialist um, here at Park Island School with Edmonton Public, and I'm also um, teaching at the university this year as well. So thanks for joining us. Thanks, Nicole. And Darren. Evening, everyone. My name is Darren Hamilton. I am a secondary school teacher at Davis Suzuki Secondary School with the Peel District School Board. Um, I also teach gospel choir at the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Music there. And uh, I've been teaching for 15 years now. Thank you, Darren. 
It was a very humble introduction from Darren as usual. Uh, Darren is also the uh, 2022 Music Counts Teacher of the Year, uh, which we're very delighted um, to celebrate Darren's incredible teaching uh, through that award. We actually were able to make a really short you know, documentary about Darren and his teaching, and we'll drop that in the comments as well. Open that in a new tab, watch it after the show. It's an amazing little documentary about Darren and his approach to music education is so important. Um, so yeah, congratulations again, Darren. Um, okay, so how we structure these conversations, it's gonna be pretty informal, pretty casual, uh, just an open dialogue with, with our panelists. I have it kind of structured into three broad topics. So we'll start with topic one and then we'll go from there. So to start, I'm hoping that each of our panelists can talk through what their priorities are as a music educator uh, in Canada right now and how your priorities as, as a music educator are reflected in your school's music program. Um, Steve, did you wanna kick things off for us? Sure. Um... One of my big priorities is uh, creativity, but also I prioritize rock ensembles, rock music, popular music ensembles. Um, and when I talk about creativity, it's more so, you know, it seems to be that lost art that we've, you know, music is a creative art form, but we seem to kind of forget that when we're teaching music, because we want to make sure, you know, they have the right notes, they have the you know, they have all these things that they're supposed to have. Um, but I am a big believer in learner ownership and being able to create their own music, but also connecting to students and, uh, you know, engaging the unengaged through popular music ensembles and being able to branch them out into those, those types of ensembles as well, because kids need uh, as much as they can possibly get in music education. So that's kind of my, the gist of what I got in a nutshell and the gist of my my philosophy and approach. Awesome, thank you, Steve. Uh, Sita, what about you? Well, my priority is, uh, well, rebuilding after COVID because we had two years of no music and lo a lot of students lost motivation or skills or, or just the love of it. So my priority is one, to rebuild and two, to have a more representative music program in the community that I work in um, by providing a lot of different types of instruments. And also, I just really want the kids to love to come to class. And so however I can make it engaging and entertaining and not slam them with notation and theory, as Steve said, uh, yeah, definitely. I want them to feel like music is a part of who they are, which is important to their identity. Amazing. And before we move on, um, I know that this year you got um, a grant through the Music Counts Band-Aid program to broaden that music program at your school. So can you just tell us a little bit about what that will look like now for you? Well, we've we got $20,000, which was incredible. I couldn't even believe when you guys called me. Um, I think I actually told the, the woman who called me, I was like, shut up. So it was amazing. Um, so we spent the money. We have a whole class set of steel pans. Um, I work in a community that has a lot of students from the Caribbean, um, so I thought that would be something. We got a lot of djembes um, to represent. We have students from a lot from Nigeria and Ghana, and a couple doles, which are um, South Asian side drums, and a couple harmoniums, which are sort of like an accordion. So the students, when they come to my class, there are things that are familiar and it piques their interest. And you know, my boss, when she met me, she goes, do you know how to play steel pan? And coincidentally, yes. So we met at the right time and without music counts, it never would have happened. So yeah, they're enjoying it. We're working on a Soka Calypso version of hot crust buns right now, but uh, it's working. <laughs> so. awesome. Cool, that's so good to hear. Thanks so much. Uh, Nicole. I guess what I'm really working on right now, um, I spent a year at the university um, learning and unlearning and relearning. And my biggest priority right now is that my students see themselves in the curriculum, very much like what Zeta was saying, um, that they see themselves in, uh, I use a lot of picture books that I use for springboards so that there's diversity in what we're um, kind of framing our classes around. Um, and that the music that they make is coming from them and from their culture and from their interests. Um, and also my other priority is um, to have students understand the music 
of Canada. And I don't mean that has been brought over, but the music of our Indigenous peoples here. So that has been a really big priority for me in my program here as well. So lots of different ways of identifying, but also knowing the music of the land that they're on. Amazing. Thanks, Nicole. And I think sometimes it might be easier for for people to visualize that kind of content happening in a secondary music classroom. What what does that look like in your elementary classroom? Mm, that's a good question. Um, in elementary, so I'm doing a lot of work with identity right now. Um, that has been framed it. I it was a research project that I did or an assignment that I did for grad school. I'm like, I'm going to plan for the fall in June. So um, I mean, doing an identity, some identity work. And so for us, we're looking at, um, oh, we started with that we all belong and we all belong here. We look at our skin color and celebrate diversity with our skin color and that it's the qualities on our inside that makes us who we are. Um, and so we're moving through this idea of that we are all treaty people is where I'm going with this and that we are all, um, we all are supposed to be here. We are all equal and, and just using different types of music. Um, we're doing, we've been doing stuff from Africa. Um, we've been doing pop music. We've been doing all different kinds of, um, genres just to kind of, and it's part of me trying to rediscover my students. I've been at the same school for many, many years, but being away and being back in a school after um, a traveling cart when we weren't allowed to sing, um, we're kind of rebuilding everything again. And so it's it feels like a really clean slate for us where we can just, you know, if the things that we've done before are going to look a little bit different here. So um, we're just rebuilding and making people feel comfortable with being in the music room and and just seeing where we're going to go from there. But um, yeah, it is it is also a rebuild for me as well, even though I've known these children for many, many years. But um, yeah, I don't know if that totally answered the question, but. No, for sure. <laughs> Um, and Darren, what are your priorities as a music teacher? Oh, we can't hear you, Darren. I think you're muted. Oh. You know, I have some of the same priorities that everyone else has mentioned. So, you know, focusing on um, diversity and ensuring that uh, music from various um, cultures and various styles are represented uh, in the the classroom, um, ensuring that uh, students are um, having an opportunity to um, be involved in the decision making of what they're going to be learning is, is a big part of what I uh, I do. Um, in fact, this this year we just took a completely different turn from our music classroom, and uh, we're actually going to be exploring um, our instrumental music class uh, as a uh, a pop modern band class for the entire semester uh, and in past years we've uh you know we've tried we've explored uh both concert band the traditional concert band format along with pop music um and now we're experimenting with um you know going straight fully pop music modern music and the interesting thing is um, being able to present uh, the option to the students and to see the students responses um you know, deciding between concert band and popular music and to see 75% of the, the population in the class, you know, uh, expressing that they have that desire to, to learn popular music. Um, and then of course, uh, students, uh, so student-centered learning, rebuilding, and then uh, something that I'm very passionate about is social justice education. Social justice is such a huge um, piece in our society, in our world today, and uh, being able to um, bring conversations uh, about social justice into the classroom through music and to help students explore how music is used as a tool for uh, advocating and for addressing social societal issues um, is really important to me. Awesome. Thank you, Darren. And before we move on from that, Darren, do you want to speak a little bit about what you did, um, was it last year or a couple of years ago, in implementing the hip-hop program at your school and how you surveyed the students and what was that like? <laughs> Yes. Um, so I had a concern um, being at my school for at that particular point in 2019. It was my third year at my current school and um, you know, noticing that there weren't a lot of 
um, students from um, from racialized backgrounds or marginalized backgrounds attending my music classroom, um, although they had um, the um, the although they were in a situation where they had a racialized teacher at their school, which is you know not common. And so what we did is we interviewed students during lunchtime for an entire week. We went out into the hallways. Uh, we approached students um, who weren't taking music class and we asked them, why aren't you taking music class? Um, what has been your experiences with music outside the classroom? What has been your experiences with music in elementary school? And, um, and what would it take to get you into the music classroom? So we presented them with a list of uh, different genres of music that they could um, select from in terms of what their musical interests were and we asked them if we were to uh, to offer or present a new music course offering um, what genre of music would you be interested in and the results of that survey um, came with uh, hip-hop at the top of the, the list followed by R&B as a close second and so as a result of that um, we had applied to, uh, two music accounts for a grant to uh, which we were uh, awarded uh, to receive um, to go ahead and purchase a class set of DJ consoles and we were able to implement and start a new program, a hip hop and R&B program at our school, which is now in its second year of, of running. Awesome. Thanks, Darren. Uh, a major theme from all of your responses to that question is something that, that you said in your response, Steve, uh, this idea of engaging the unengaged. What were the biggest hurdles that some of you faced in making these uh, these changes to your program to in an effort to engage those students that weren't engaged before what was that process like was it hard was it did it feel easy did you feel equipped to do it um for me it felt fairly you know fairly natural to me because it was something that i was kind of thinking about when i was in my university program um you know classically trained trombonist here <laughs> um and uh it was a lot of thinking about why we kind of exclude these types of ensembles like a rock band or something like that often in in programs uh, even though they exist plentifully outside of school um, and hip-hop as well and r b and all of this indigenous music and and everything exists in like so much of it exists outside of school but in school it was a lot of the band model or a choir and you know that gets some kids for sure but it's about offering more and it's about making sure that you're touching you're getting more kids into your program it's not about taking away it's not it's about adding to and we want to make sure that that is one of the priorities but i found that for me getting to that point was fairly easy but i did still have some of those holdovers from my university days where you know uh we have to do all this notation we have to do the theory and i kind of had to unlearn that as i went along because yes there is important yes staff notation state staff notation is important in some contexts so i had to kind of come to this realization that you know tab is also legitimate and important in some situations and you know different types of notations exist that are legitimate other than staff notation which was something i had it took a long time for me to kind of fully realize i mean i had learned how to read some tab in university and high school but never really thought much of it you know but it is a form of notation that is standardized and folks uh, sometimes can't read because it's it's new so i think what i've come to at this point in my teaching is being able to realize that you know there are many 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 more ways to music let's say using christopher small um, as a reference there than we've been giving kids credit for over the years and i think we've we've lost a lot of kids along the way but i think if we offer as much as we possibly can to to engage the other 80 percent they say because when you get into junior high at least on pei it's banned or nothing and uh you know it's it's a shame that you get you know only about 20 percent engagement in the music program after that because of because of the choices that they 
uh, do not have. For sure. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Any responses to that? Zeta, what was it like when you implemented your steel pan program? Did you notice a change in, in student interest in music class once the instruments and the music started speaking to their culture more? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is actually my, I've been teaching for 20 years, but this is actually only my second year as a full-time music teacher. Last year's music camp uh, was my first year. And so it was great to get the grant. Um, but I had, I mean, I had done here and there, but I found that something familiar to the students was really engaging. Like I always liken it to, you know, if I watch a big blockbuster American movie and they mention anything about Canada or, or say, oh, Toronto, I'm always like, oh, look, they mentioned us, right? And you get, you, you perk up. And so for my students to come into my classroom and for me to put on, um, I don't know, a, a Nigerian singer or, you know, uh, a Muswala, a Punjabi singer, and we learn those songs, for them, it's very familiar. So they actually want to do it because it's not so foreign, like notation in classical music, um, because for them, I mean, our students have a huge heritage behind them. And some of our musical heritage with my students is thousands and thousands of years old. So I think it's really good to have that familiarity. And when it's something that they know and they're comfortable with, they, you know, they're very, very engaged. So with the steel pans, we've been playing Caribbean music. I mean, we just started, so we're learning the notes and the different types of pans. Um, but they, they like it because it's always engaging. Like they're not sitting there filling a worksheet of every good boy deserves fudge. And that because it, steel pan is taught very differently than it's, it's by doing a lot. And it's also percussion. So the kids love hitting stuff, right? Um, so yeah, so I think it's been a, a really good start. Awesome. Something I just wanna add to what she said there. Um, you mentioned that it's learned differently. And I think that's really important because most cultures in the world learn music in a group, you know, together without notation and it's communal, you know, and, and we play together and we jam together, but then in school we have to play a certain way and it's something it's either right or it's wrong. And unfortunately that's been the way it's been for a long time. But I, I just wanted to pick up on that point that you made. Uh, that these approaches like rock music or or steel pan or hip hop or whatever, they all have their particular ways of learning that are all very similar, actually, um, because they're often learned informally or passed down from generations. Uh, and that's something that takes some some on learning on, on our part as teachers, because we were trained to teach a certain way uh, that may not speak to a lot of different cultures and ways of musicking around the world. As each of you have, you know, made these changes to the music programs at your school, what were you, were you supported? Were you kind of incentivized by, by your administrators or by others, or was, were these things that you kind of, you, you took it on kind of on your own because you kind of, you saw that that was important and you believe that was important. For me, I definitely thought it was important. Uh, it was one of the first things I did. I, my first gig was out in uh, Fortune PEI, which is like on almost almost the most most northern tip of PEI. I guess it's most eastern tip of PEI, and uh, tiny little school. There's 53 kids. It was grades one to four. Uh, it closed that year, but anyway, uh, <laughs> that's beside the point. But the very first thing I did was see if I could start a rock band with them. And we did eventually. And the VP at the time was, you know, supportive, very supportive. And everyone was very supportive. And then at the end of the year, she admitted to me, she's like, it sounded crazy. I uh, honestly thought it was crazy, <laughs> but it sounded awesome. <laughs> you know, and they did a great job. So after that, they were like, do whatever you want, you know, <laughs> and um, they trusted me after that. And then I went to a new school. They'd already been starting doing something like this already. And I just kind of took it to the next level at that point. Uh, so I had a bit of support there already. But I do remember uh, in the interview for the school I'm at now, actually, 
uh, I've been there for 14, 13 years, give or take. Um, and in the interview, they said, do you play piano? And would you be willing to learn? And I said, uh-huh. Yes, I will learn. And I still never learned piano. I don't know how to play piano very well. Uh, but I use guitar a lot. And uh, <laughs> again, the principal later admitted, yeah, uh, you probably don't need to play piano. <laughs> so, you know, it, it took a little bit of a little bit of greasing, but I think that's like anything new, right? People don't like change. So you just kind of got to do your thing and, and convince them the best way you can. Thanks, Steve. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I think administration makes all the difference. One, like huge. I mean, um, I'm very, very lucky to have my current administration um, because the moment she mentioned, you know, she's really into culturally, culturally responsive education. Um, and, you know, if I said, oh, if she was the one who was trying to find money before the grant. She's like, we got to get steel pans in here and, and things like that. And she was so supportive, so enthusiastic. Um, and I haven't experienced that. I mean, I have been trying to do steel pans for a very long time, even just as an ex extracurricular music teacher. And, and, you know, I would approach admin and, oh, why would we do that? You know, or well, what kind of music is that? I don't know that. I don't want to do that. And so because they were so focused on this Eurocentric thing. So for for almost all of my teaching career, the last two, three years have been the time where administration was like, you know what? I think it's a really good idea to represent the community. So my principal, Ms. Francis, uh, she uh, I, I can't uh, be grateful enough for what how she supported us. Awesome. Any other thoughts on that? I think um, I'm in with a new administration um, and she's wonderful. And I've had the same principal. Well, I've been here for 18 years at the same school. And um, I, our previous administrator, it was what's best for children. What is best for children? And he trusted our judgment. And then when it comes to indigenous music, I mean, in our, um, TQS as teachers are teaching quality standards. It's expected for us to be doing indigenous music. And so the fact that I'm just doing it because this is what's good for children and it's an expectation is completely supported. Um, and so whenever I'm making changes, that's that's the focus, what's best for children. It doesn't always align what's expected in the curriculum. The curriculum that we have in Alberta is still hasn't changed. We're kind of in this limbo and my curriculum was from 1980 something 86 yeah. 89 and so what's best from children now is not from 1986 so um we're always you know of course we're going to teach the notation um because it is expected and we want our children to have curriculum but not at the expense of not exposing our children and doing music for all of our children um because the knowledge and um, culture of all of our children is valid and important. And so that's kind of been the focus here at school. Awesome. Yeah, if I could add, um, yeah, I would definitely agree with everyone else about the importance of having supportive um, administration, um, you know, um, and administration that understands and puts students first. And I think for me, when I was starting the hip hop uh, program at my school, we definitely had a very supportive uh, principal. Um, being able to present uh, the principal with hardcore data from the students' voices, what they were expressing in terms of um, what types of music they were interested in listening to and, and uh, engaging with at school and why they weren't engaging in music um, because um, of their view of music being, um, you know, a, a concert band format or a concert choir format or a Eurocentric format that didn't um, cater to their personal interests or needs. Um, and so I think that was very important. I too, like um, Zeta, have experienced in, in previous schools with previous administrations, what it's like to be trying to push um, a diverse uh, program forward. I remember at one of my older schools, I was running a popular um, music ensemble 
and uh, we had um, a djembe ensemble. We had a lot of different things happening that weren't, um, you know, the traditional concert program. And then the next year, they uh, they intentionally hired a uh, a music teacher to come into the school that had more of the traditional programming, and that was the thing that got pushed at the school. And so I've seen that happen where, um, you know, those, if you don't have a, an administrator that understands um, what the needs of the students are or puts the needs first and just kind of um, comes in and has a narrow view of what music should be, comes in and tells you that, you know, you have to learn to, you have to, learn to play the piano. You are expected to be able to play the piano in order to run a music program at the school because that's their narrow view of what uh, a music program should look like, then um, that certainly kills the program and it certainly um, excludes students from being able to engage in music. And I think um, it's, it's so important that we really work hard to uh, ensure that all students have an opportunity to, to engage in music at school. Um, one of the things I share with my students all the time, and many people may not know this, but I never took a single um, high school course. I never took a single music course when I was in high school. And here I am years down the road uh, working as a, a music teacher. And and that was because the music that I was in, um, engaged in and that I was attracted to and that I wanted to um, to learn and, and engage with wasn't being offered in, in the music classroom at my school. And so I had to turn to the community I had to um, get my music engagement from the community, and a lot of our kids are doing that. They're, you know, participating in pop bands, or garage bands outside of school, or they're engaging in music through their churches and and community ensembles, because they're not able to do the music that they are interested in doing in schools. And so we just uh, have to continue to advocate and um, help to educate administrators so that they understand that music education is not. Uh, one thing that it, it, there's certain, certainly many different ways that music education can be done in our schools. Well said, thank you, Darren. Um, it seems like when we're talking about this narrow view of music education that feels pervasive, um, it feels like that's kind of a learned, a learned thing. We people are kind of taught that music education is a singular thing, and we all went through, um, you know, educational institutions that may probably reinforce that in one way or another. So. As music teachers, what are the ways that you're always learning and what are the ways that you're also unlearning alongside that? Um, Nicole, did you wanna start us off on that one? I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so last year, well, it's, I've been kind of on a long track of finishing my graduate studies, but um, last year I had the opportunity to take the year off to do, be a full-time student. And um, I do not take that for granted one bit because every single course that I took was completely unlearning and relearning. Um, and it, it was, my focus was on indigenizing and decolonizing music education. And so my courses, some of them were indigenous foundational knowledge where I looked at curriculum and pedagogy through an indigenous lens. Um, I was taking courses on orality. Um, I took courses on um, oral traditions and it was always thinking, and that those were not educate or music education courses. Those were education courses. And so in the back of my mind, I was always thinking about how does this apply to music education? I also took a pop music course that was offered through um, Martina Basel from Dr. Martina Basel from University of uh, Kentucky, Ken Kentucky. I think that's right. Um, and so that totally changed my mind. And I was able to apply that to Indigenous music. And I did um, some Indigenous hip hop music. Um, I also, I finished my course with culturally relevant pedagogy in music education. And so everything that I took, it was spiraled. And I could not have picked um, a better year to take the moment to take the pause and to look at um, how the world has is changing and always changing. But I feel like during the pandemic, a lot of the change was um, under the microscope. And I knew that I could not continue the business as usual in music education. And so I just, um, I know that Creator was the one who actually 
put that program together for me because as much as I think that I was in charge, the way that they were complementary for the entire um, 10 courses that I took, I could never have, have planned that for myself. So um, I'm maybe a little addicted to, to learning and unlearning right now, um, but I just, I think um, there are so many opportunities out there. Um, and I think the pan the one thing about pandemic is opportunities to have conversations still online that doesn't seem to have stopped. People have looked at how can I find um, people who are thinking like I'm thinking or how are we able to make these changes in music education? Um, I think there's so many opportunities still across our nations to engage um, at a broader broader level. So I think the opportunities are are there and um, I'm so thankful for that actually. So thanks, Nicole. Steve, it looks like you're brimming <laughs> with something to say. Um, well, my journey for unlearning and relearning and all this, it's constant. And I uh I'm I, I'm constantly right. I like to write about music education and that's kind of my thinking time about how I think about music education and get my thoughts on paper, uh, paper, no one writes paper, what's paper, um, get it kind of down so that I can think about how we think about <laughs> music education, very meta, you know. Um, and one thing I've done for myself is learn how to improvise on the trombone because i was growing up in two complete opposite worlds in school i was baritone euphonium and trombone and all by staff notation and something that i've learned to start saying is staff notation because when we say notation we automatically think staff notation but like i said earlier there's so many different kinds of stat of notation. So when I say staff notation, that kind of makes me think about that is just one, right? And that's had to be, I had to train myself to say that. Sometimes I'll say even central uh, Central European staff notation to be even more specific because outside of that, there are many types of other notations as well that we kind of forget about. Uh, but learning to improvise was something that I never did on the on the uh, trombone because I was classically trained, but in high school, I was also learning drums, you know, like 90% by ear. Uh, and I took a couple, a few lessons on drums, but I was mostly trained on trombone and everything like that. So I was, you know, learning by ear and improvising on drum set at the same time, I was doing the complete opposite. Uh, go, and, I, and if you took the page away from me on trombone, I couldn't do anything. Like, I'm sure it's a familiar story for many of us, uh, classically trained folks. Uh, so I actually now seek out opportunities for myself to improvise on the trombone. And the first few times, it was awful. <laughs> like, it was bad. But uh, you get better as you go. And that's basically how most musicians learn how to play their instrument outside of the, you know, academia is they just play and if it sounds bad they just do it again anyway and you know they just get better eventually uh and they kind of learn on their own um and i had a great opportunity to join a a ska band that i we recorded two studio albums and all original music so i was kind of i had to improvise because we wrote all our own music and i was playing trombone on that um and then after that i was like becoming gradually more comfortable with improvising and getting better at it and not thinking about it and then um joined the uh, local big band and didn't take any solos at first at all because jazz just intimidated me because it was always like uh, when I thought about jazz, uh, you know, improv and stuff in my university program, it was you got to know all of the theories, every single thing about theory. And then and then you can improvise a solo. But the opposite is actually true. Um, you got to play first. And if you don't play, you're not going to learn that stuff. Um, and you may not even, you know, because like, it's almost like mathematical to, in a sense, like uh, when I, 
when I hear, um, you know, some jazz, it gets to a point where it's so mathematical because it's these folks that know theory so well, and they're kind of just playing theory in front of you and showing off their math skills. Um, but then there's folks that play like with a lot of soul and a lot of, uh, feel and you know they play a melody which is a weird thing in jazz sometimes you know the the elusive melody um so anyway it, it intimidated me and so i just eventually started playing and now i take solos all the time in, in that band uh and it's no different than any, any other type of improvising at, in the end um so my, my, my journey is ongoing, essentially, and uh, I just encourage folks to, uh, you know, if you want to learn to improvise, then then do that. And uh, that will certainly free your musicianship. Take the page away and just play. Yeah. Um, you know, write about it. Uh, talk about it with other educators. Uh, invite a friend over and just make something up. <laughs> learn something by ear. That's something that was, you know, we don't do enough of either learning by ear. So, uh, and that's something I'm still learning too, <laughs> you know, as a classically trained trombonist, we didn't do that, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I learned that on drums. So I kind of had to bridge the gap, I suppose, like bring one from over here and bring them closer together. So that's a, my, a, that's my two cents. As a classically trained tuba player, I can, I can relate <laughs> to uh, that discomfort and improvising on the tuba. Um, but yeah, it must have felt really terrifying at first because you're kind of throwing, um, you know, all of the, everything that you've learned, kind of putting, setting that aside and kind of starting from scratch must be a really terrifying feeling. And I loved what you were talking about, you know, how we should refer to notation as staff notation, because I often hear this idea of, you know, the reason for maintaining, you know, Western first, you know, music approaches and music classrooms is like the foundation of music literacy that is so important. But of course, there are so many approaches to literacy and music and understanding how music works. Um, so I think the way that you phrased that was was fantastic. Um, uh, Darren, I saw your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to add to that, uh, thank you, Steve. Um, I think for me, throughout my years of teaching, um, I've been unlearning this um, this philosophy that music education equals performance and mm -hmm. learning that music education is uh, a wide range of things. Um, and so um, one of the things that uh, I've been really focusing on is exploring the entire curriculum. And, you know, if we look at our curriculum documents, we will recognize that there are a lot of things in our music curriculum that a lot of performance-based programs don't even cover or touch because their focus is so heavily on performance. But um, things like exploring the relationship between music and, and community, re relationship between music and, um, and social justice, um, looking at the relationship between music and a variety of different careers in music. And so, um, so that's something that I've been um, unlearning um, I love what Steve was just mentioning about, um, you know, music literacy and musicianship skills. Um, and what came to my mind was the movie uh, Drumline, uh, which I hope everyone has seen with Nick Cannon. And uh, to to imagine that the Nick Cannon who played um, a drummer in the marching band at the university or at the college, to imagine that um, he was the best player in the drumming band until um, they discovered that he couldn't read, that he had memorized all of his music, learned it by ear. That's how he got through the audition and he gained entrance into the Gosh. college. And oh. then the moment that they discovered that he couldn't read music, they were ready to kick him out of the program. You know, and, and that's what's been happening to our kids and our students, students who have amazing musicianship skills, um, the, the skills to learn music by ear, that skill is not being valued at the same level as the skill of being able to read music on standard notation, standard staff notation. I'm gonna start using that term now. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's just as valuable. I grew up in, um, in a black church, um, grew up singing gospel music, grew up listening to gospel, jazz, R&B, all of these genres of music that um, I was engaged in, and it was all music that I um, I learned and I participated in 
by ear. I would listen to, you know, a recording of an R&B song and then I would sing it back what I heard on the recording. And that's how I developed my oral musicianship skills to the point that I can hear something on a recording, I can hear in harmony, and I don't have to rely on that harmony being written out on paper for me to be able to sing that harmony back, but I can pick it out because of that skill that I developed by ear. And it, I find it so interesting. I teach at, at the university and um, when I teach gospel choir at the university, I have students who have um, predominantly Western training come into my class. And when they have to learn how to sing gospel music by ear and the struggle that you see them have when they're learning to um, learn this cultural music or this other genre that has a oral tradition, I think what we have to understand is that students that come from these traditions who have been for so long forced to learn music by uh, the Western method, they have experienced that same struggle where they've they struggle with music notation and then they get kicked out or they, they fail their music classes and then they get demotivated from taking music any further because they are they tell themselves, I can't do this, I can't be successful at this. And so uh, I think it's really important for us as music educators to, re to unlearn that. And um, I just got an email just the other day from a student of mine. Um, I usually take my students to um, trips to different places and expose them to different careers in the music industry. Uh, several years ago, I had an opportunity to take my class to Metalworks to learn about um, careers in audio recording. And I actually had a student graduate and end up going to Metalworks to, um, to do their program. And they just uh, emailed me just last week to tell me that they've graduated and then now they're looking for a job as a recording engineer and they like to use me as a reference and so to know that a student has gone through music education and they came out on the other end not as a performer but they found something else that is related to music that they're interested in and they found the pathway to be able to explore that further um, is something that i think is so amazing and i i think it's something that we all should be uh, aspiring to do and to to provide for our students well said thank you darren um Nicole, I know you raised your hand a while ago. I was just um, so much of what Darren was saying. I have a 16 year old son um, who is probably one of my best teachers, um, who is the one who came home from band class. He has had a wonderful band teacher. And he's like, did you know, mom, that we should not be referring to um, music theory as music theory? It is Western music theory. And I'm like, you are 100 percent right. And this is coming from a child who I am classically trained and I expected him to kind of follow the same track and that he's just starting to learn music, but has been taking lessons since he was six years old. He's a drummer. And to watch him just be able to do music by ear is actually really frustrating for me because it's super, super natural. And had I made him follow my track, he, he would have a totally different experience and it would be very limited. Um, we went away this summer and I think it was within like a day. We came home and like, what are you doing today? He's like, oh, we're going to go and rent me a banjo for just to see if I like it. I'm like, but you don't know how to play the banjo, but he figures it out. And that is how he does it. He's just like, but I can do it. I can, I can listen. I can look on YouTube. I can do this. And his ear has been his biggest guide and his heart and what he's interested in. And so now I just let him go. And I actually listen to what he's saying because it's nice to have somebody with their ear to the ground um, to know what actually students are wanting and children are wanting and what's relevant to them. Um, and if I didn't have him, I don't know if I would have as much of an understanding and I probably would be stuck in my ways of this is how it's supposed to be. Um, mm. But he's breaking that for us. So it's been really refreshing. Thanks, Nicole. Theta. Um, as a classical musician, I couldn't stand notation. In fact, you're very funny, Nicole. I used to make my piano teacher play the song first, and then I would play it by ear and pretend I was reading the music. So I was never a fan of um, notation. But when we were talking about you're talking about learning from your son, um, I wanted to bring up an example today in music class. One student said, when you warm up the choir, why don't you use the canardic scale? And I went, what was that? Because I don't know. 
And it's a, a Tamil Telugu scale that they use that has different, it's not staff notation, it's non-Western scales. Uh, and so today we talked about the Hamadati scale. And I went through it. There are thousands, thousands of different types of key, key signatures and, and what we would define as scales. And I was going through them and then it clicked on my unlearning was when I used to do vocals, I found that a lot of my South Asian students had a hard time doing do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And I could never get it. I would get frustrated because of my own, you know, conditioning. And now today, these two students walked me through it. They sang it for me and it all made sense on why that Western scale was so difficult for them. And so I feel like for me with specifically the South Asian instruments, the Caribbean things, and I'm okay with, you know, I grew up with that, but I find the community is so important to get your info from. Um, I, I'm always asking kids like, how do I do this? What does that mean? How do I sing this in Hindi? How do I sing this? Like, how does this work? And for me, at least doing this new program, the students are my biggest way that I can unlearn how I've learned music. That's awesome. Thanks, Ada. Um, I do want to move on to our last topics that I think it's going to be one of the more interesting ones. And then I want to leave a little bit of room for question. Gosh, time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, we've talked a lot about the issues in music education. So what is your vision for more inclusive music education culture in Canada? And what are the, some, some of the bigger barriers that we need to dismantle to get there? Um, Nicole, you had your hand up. Do you want to kick us off on that one too? Sure. Um, so for me, it our curriculum, well, I'm speaking from an old curriculum, but our curriculum needs to reflect our students and the changes that are happening. Um, and it, it's from everything that we're saying, we're excluding people. Um, I would say a large percentage, a huge percentage of our children um, from those opportunities because of what the curriculum is making us do. And, and I think as teachers, we're, we're afraid to stray for our job's sake, because that's not necessarily in the curriculum. And if you're not looking at the curriculum through different lenses, we are restricted. We feel restricted. And that's what I hear from people. Well, it doesn't say this and it doesn't, um, you know, I have to get through the curriculum. I'm like, but you can do it in many different ways. And that's what I, we hear all the time. It's, but it's not in the curriculum or I don't know how to do it because it's not in the curriculum. Um, and so, I'm hopeful that we can one day have a curriculum um, that is reflective of our students, but to also have supporting resources um, to make sure that um, these initiatives in uh, cult culturally relevant pedagogy that is, you know, research that we know is um, good for everybody, um, but we need to have the resources and ways of um, and resources always comes down to money <laughs> and being able to engage our communities and bring people in to share their music as well. Um, I think m my vision is just that we get to a point where it it's just natural and normal and we aren't questioned um, on what's best for children um, and that we can continually move forward and not be stuck in the past. So that's how I'm feeling here. Thanks, Nicole. Steve? Um, on that note, too, it, one of the biggest issues, I think, with the reason why we're not moving forward with this is because of the teacher training programs, because they are all classically trained musicians and often and not all the time, but often uh, they have very little teaching background and they come in. You know, they go through a master's program, go right through a PhD, whatever. And, you know, all of their training in music is uh, through the uh, the lens of the classical canon or the um, uh, the conservatory approach, let's call it. Um, and then that's perpetuated through the teachers that go through those programs and then, you know, impart that knowledge onto their their learners. Um, so the, one of the biggest issues for me is at the university level. And 
I'm not sure that's a <laughs> that's a real difficult one to crack because of the perpetuity of of what's happening at at universities essentially where they're trained to be academics and they're trained to study classical music and this seems to be from my um we'll call, we'll call them discussions on Twitter this seems to be a problem only in North America <laughs> <laughs> uh, like it's a strictly North American issue where teachers are trained at the, in the conservatory approach only. Um, and at most other places seem to kind of have it figured out at the teacher training level anyway. But in North America, it seems to be we're holding on to this tradition of classically trained uh, band uh, orchestra choir. And I'm not saying those are terrible things because they're great avenues of for music education um it may just take a rethinking or an addition adding more things to it to make it more inclusive so that's that's my my approach there thanks steve darren yeah i was actually going to say the same thing as steve you beat me to the punch there um so definitely teacher education is a uh, an area that i feel um needs to be um it needs to be um restructured and um but even before teacher education i think we need to take a really close look at our undergrad music programs that our music uh, our musicians who are going into teacher education mm -hmm. are doing um and i think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of um really looking at how we can diversify course offerings in the university programs and we can all and looking at how we make um, our degree programs, uh, we structure them in such a way that taking a certain number of courses outside of the Western cas uh, classical canon becomes a requirement for your undergrad degree, um, as opposed to an option. Um, there are a lot of universities that are offering courses outside of the canon, but they're optional courses. And so what's happening is uh, several uh, music educators are still going through their programs going through the, the classical model and not taking these optional courses. And so then they're going to teacher training and they're perpetuating um, this cycle of Western uh, teaching in, in the classroom. And so I think that's important. And then lastly, uh, in terms of my vision, I think um, getting to a place where we as educators can, um, our, our, when we can consider what the pathways of our students are and not where, where we think they should be going. Um, I think that if we can consider what pathways our students are interested in pursuing and we can, um, you know, we, we've all been trained on differentiated instruction. And so if we can differentiate our teaching in such a way that we are meeting the needs of our students in terms of where they desire to go, as opposed to um, formulating programs or pushing programs on our students that send them in a narrow path where we think they should go, I think is something that we need to certainly um, look at doing. Thank you, Darren. Anyone else have any thoughts on that lofty question <laughs> that I posed? <laughs> Depends, do we have another hour? Um... <laughs> we do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's so fascinating to hear you all talk about, you know, the, the strides that you've made with the music programs at your school um, and how that has resulted in, you know, uh, more student engagement and, and, you know, kids being more enthusiastic about music class, but your own music training hasn't necessarily prepared you to, to do that. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's interesting in of itself. Um, we do have a couple of questions, um, not too, too many, but if you have a question, now it's not too late, you can put it in the comments now. Um, we have a question for Darren, and they're looking for you to give an example of how you might merge um, uh, diversity of music and social justice in the classroom <laughs> and you might have a great answer <laughs> for that sure um tons of answers and this might be a, a good way to do a um a, a plug for the hashtag black music matters resource um, that was created for music counts um and the way that i've done that is through um lyric analysis musical analysis of songs um getting students to get beyond um, just listening to music just for what's happening instrumentally but really taking a close look at musical lyrics and what 
uh, lyrics of different songs are communicating, what are artists um, or songwriters trying to communicate through lyrics, um, and how um, those lyrics um, relate specifically to social justice, um, social justice issues. And mm -hmm. so um, that's the way that I've explored social justice in the classroom and not only social justice, but other um, important um, societal issues um, such as anti-bullying, um, things such as mental health. Um, you know, we take a song like um, Beautiful by Christina Aguilera, I'm beautiful no matter what they say, words can't bring me down. You know, she's talking about uh, self-esteem and she's also um, talking about overcoming um, anti-bullying, words can't bring you down. So really looking at lyrics of songs um, in that way um, and having students um, do that type of analysis to identify what are key themes, what are key messages that um, songs are trying to communicate and how they tie to either um, social justice issues or other important societal issues such as mental health, anti-bullying, et cetera, the environment. Um, we've covered you know, songs like Earth Song by Michael Jackson, um, just looking at how these songs are, uh, cover and, and talk about and address all these uh, important societal issues. Cool. Thanks, Darren. And yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I went through uh, a classical training, undergraduate degree in music, um, that kind of path, and I could... I could conduct a band right now if you made me, but I, I couldn't teach a steel pans class. I couldn't teach a DJ class. Um, but it doesn't need to be that bold of a first step in terms of changing the program. There are a lot of smaller things that you can do and a lot of resources that are out there that, in, that are designed for folks that don't have experience in those genres of music. And music counts, we, we have a few. Um, that are meant for those teachers who, you know, you're interested maybe in talking about hip hop in the classroom. Darren's resource is a great starting point. It's designed for teachers that have no foundation in that music. Nicole was a part of making a resource all about contemporary indigenous music as a way to bring conversations about reconciliation into the classroom. Um, and that's designed for teachers that don't have much of a foundation in that area. So it doesn't need to be a big, bold, transformative Thing that you do uh, at your school. Uh, it can be as simple as introducing a new conversation, a new resource, and seeing how your students respond and maybe going from there. Um, any final thoughts from any of our panelists before we wrap things up? Well, thank you all uh, for taking the time to share your wisdom with everyone. It's been a pleasure speaking with all of you tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in and taking the time. Again, I know you're busy, so the fact that you're taking the time to listen to this, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you again to Lyric Find um, for sponsoring our town hall tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. And if you're interested in changing what music education looks like at your school, um, you can apply to the Band-Aid program. Uh, as you saw from the panel tonight, a few of the teachers here applied for funds through the Band-Aid program to broaden what music education looked like at their school. So that's always an avenue you can take as well. And applications opened today. So whether you're looking for trombones or turntables, you can ask for whatever kind of musical gear you need to make sense for kids at your school. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Good and night. Uh, we'll see you soon. Good night. Bye, folks. <laughs>